Hi, my name is uh, Damien Flynn. I'm a systems architect with Linebridge Technologies. I'm also an author and a blogger and an MVP with Microsoft Systems Center as my expertise. Damien, thanks for joining us. Um, can we just start, if you can just give us a little bit of background about yourself. You're a Microsoft MVP. Yeah, I'm uh, three years an MVP. Um, I started off originally in uh, virtualization, and uh, since then we've evolved into the full system center suite. So I've got expertise across all of the main uh, facets of the actual uh, system center suite, from service manager to, to operations manager, virtual machine manager, app controller, taking it up into the public cloud, um, and uh, orchestration for a lot of the new automation technologies coming in. Um, I also happen to be lucky enough to have been part of the Futures Council for the Windows 2012 product release. So over the last number of years, I've been uh, spending a little bit of time working directly with the teams in Microsoft as we produce this new version of Windows, which today we get to celebrate. Fantastic. Um, so can you tell us then, what's your, what's your immediate take on, on the launch today? Uh, the buzz upstairs is absolutely fantastic. There's such a lot of different people. Um, tweezing is going on bananas at the moment, and there's just loads of interest in, in the different types of services that have just been simplified and enabled in Windows 2012, and everybody is really seems to be uh, very energized by that fact and uh, dying to get their hands on a copy of it now, I think, finally realizing that this is not just another version with a new number. There's actually a lot of new cool stuff in here. Okay, so can you can you talk us through a little bit of what, what are the new cool things in, in the, Windows Server 2012? It, the focus is really from two sides, I suppose. We, it, it's all about the cloud, obviously, and the, the scalability and the functionalities for automating. Um, and Microsoft have broken those down into four defined tiers or, or I suppose, pillars that they, they've wanted to focus on. But if I was to pull out of those alone, um, we can certainly see things that have been delivered for the developers within the operating system um, and for the IT Pro. Um, and if I think about the developers uh, for a few moments, um, we can look at some of the investments that Microsoft have made around the actual application stacks. Uh, the .NET framework has been revisions. They've introduced things like the async toolkits, which now makes their ability to actually program for obviously mobile devices and HTML5 much more efficient. Um, and, and a very simple uh, scenario here is that previously we might put a query up to a website and have to wait for that query to be rendered and our web browser as such will continue going back checking to see if there was a results. Now the server can send us an event back based on a web socket say I've got your data, time to render. So those things make it much easier and then in the actual IIS services, uh, some of the things that would have probably driven certainly the IT Pro Mad um, was the whole idea of maybe dealing with um, SSL certificates. Uh, certainly if you're running a website, you're going to secure it. Um, and if you're running at any scale, then you're going to have three, four, five copies of it. And those things all expire at the wrong time. Um, so when they expire and you forgot about it, you've got to run out, grab the certificates, install it on your servers, and then go across all every other server and do it. We've now got this theory of uh, a centralized certificate store. You drop the certificates into a file share, the server see it. The job is done. That's beautiful. <laughs> so there's a lot of nice little pieces in, in Windows 2012 that just makes our life that bit easier. Um, we've also taken a little bit of love around the FTP server that's sitting in Windows 2012, and it's now uh, intelligent enough to understand that he's been hacked, and he will actually deny an IP address and say, I'm sorry, you can't log in for the next 20 minutes because you've been hammering me too hard. So denial of services and stuff like that, we can start to actually manage and deliver, and it moves up into a much more scalable and enterprise scenario because we're not dealing with denial of services we can start scaling this stuff out um, and the, the core itself has been optimized where we're now thinking about the actual NUMA architecture of our actual servers, how memory talks or is physically located against the actual processor. We have that ability now within the likes of IIS to figure out that if my machine happens to have a pile of RAM, which parts of that RAM is actually more optimal for me to use. And then I can have lots of different websites sitting on my IIS server, every one of them completely isolated, every one of them talking specifically to their best NUMA partner. And we also have that ability to do things like CPU throttling now, so where I can turn around and say that, well, that website belongs to the HR guys, and you know I'm going to run that at 20% of the load. But that exchange server where everybody's hammering, that's the one that I keep getting complaints about that's slow, we're going to give that one 100% CPU load. So there's some really cool things in there that both the developers and the IT pros can actually start taking advantage of. We're a happy family. How does the launch fit into the into the wider context of the industry in, in terms of the uh, the other offerings in public and private cloud that, that are out there? I think the launch for Windows 2012 is really helping people to understand that even though we got public and private, 
they don't have to reinvest in skill. Um, what we have now in Windows 2012 is analogous as we move forward. Um, we can take that product today that is Windows 2012, the skills that we have for delivering up as far as this point in time, we can now take those, turn on some of the additional skills that we may have left in the world of Unix previously, PHP and Node.js and stuff like that from the developer's perspective, they now run natively in Windows as, as first level partners. Um, but not only that, we can take those same products and we can actually run them in Azure or off on our hoster site. We've done demonstrations earlier on today where we've actually taken virtual machines that we've had previously run on-premise and physically pick it up and drop it over into Azure, turn it back on and it just runs normally. Or vice versa, we've gone to a scenario where we've been up on that public cloud um, and we've put up a proof of concept, maybe a SharePoint server for example, uh, because I didn't have the resources on site, so I've ordered a new hardware and hasn't arrived. Um, so I can go ahead, I can do that proof of concept and then when the servers come, I can take that virtual machines that I deploy there and actually pull them back down and run them virtually or make a decision say, you know, I want the SharePoint to actually run on a physical server for whatever reason that may be, and I can actually go boot from VHD. Um, so I don't even have to rebuild the actual physical server, I can use that image I have. So we've got a massive amount of level platforming, I think, now happening where I suppose one of those taglines that we've got on those pillars is any app, any cloud. In essence, that cloud is now my premise or my hoster or my as or subscription for argument's sake, um, this really is something that none of the other partners or business solutions are able to deliver. Okay, so the kind the kind of changes that um, that Microsoft has been making, you talked about maybe kind of um, improvements and refinements in, in particularly in the management layer. Could you could you talk us through some some more of those in, in terms of how that helps businesses build properly cloudy solutions rather than virtualization plus. With, with, the, with the tooling that we have from a developer's pr perspective today, um, we're moving much more into HTML5, so the Visual Studio tools are embracing that directly. Our toolkits uh, within the actual APIs, we now have that ability to actually write that app, put it directly up onto the platform as a service, which is in Azure, so we can start using that skilling that we have today that we will be upscaling for anyways as we move over to the new modern UI to use things like HTML um, and it's exactly the same skill that we're using as we move it straight into an actual cloud app. So in the bespoke scenarios we obviously have our apps already run virtualized and we're moving them over but in today's world as we move forward with Windows 8 and Windows 2012 and the modern user interface we're taking all those learnings that asynchronous uh, communication and that whole idea of making sure that we're stateless in our environments we're taking that from on-premise into the cloud and using that as a model that we can easily move forward to and start embracing and I think over time we're going to get to a scenario where probably that same application with very minimal tweaks will run in any type of an environment. Unfortunately, I can't take that Azure app and run it on-premise just yet, but I think give us time. And so from the IT pro perspective as well, these things, does it, does it make it, is this about making it easier for people to um, manage the allocation of services within their businesses? And uh, that kind of that kind of management as well. I think it's pretty safe to say that the IT Pro is certainly the winner in this particular release. Uh, the IT Pro has got PowerShell now sitting under the hood. Every single thing that happens in Windows 2012 is PowerShell enabled. So again, one of those drive pillars that we had um, set out from the very forefront was that ability to manage from one place the whole in data center. Um, PowerShell is certainly that enabler. We can orchestrate, we can implement all sorts of different things. So from an IT Pro's perspective, perspective, once he takes that product that has been delivered to him by his development team, he has the ability to obviously make the decision to go into the private or the public clouds. But if he decides to stay on premise in his own pri private cloud, he now can use his PowerShell abilities from one single console, which could be a web page that you can access from any mobile device. So you could be watching baseball or whatever happens to be your game um, and continue to run your enterprise from that one secure website. So I believe in Windows 2012, we've gone up to somewhere in the region of about two and a half thousand PowerShell commands it's just added to the base product. Um, and as we turn on more modules, we get additional products. So that's it's pretty impressive. And learning wise, uh, again, it's all based on the same verbs and noun scenario. So if we've introduced ourselves already to PowerShell in version one or in version two, all we're getting is more richness. We've got more functionality lit up. I can manage DHCP, I can manage DNS directly from the PowerShell now where in previous iterations, if you were hacking, then in essence, you could use some of the magic of PowerShell and make it work. But today it's in the box. You don't have to do anything magic at all. So it just works. It just works. It just works. It just works. <laughs> 
one of the taglines that I've um, that I've seen on some of the, the paperwork from this conference is "cloud optimize your IT." Is that is that kind of the the driving idea behind the development for? Um, yeah, I, I think there, there are certainly from, from a lot of the perspectives that uh, a lot of the IT guys are still getting their head around what is the cloud and what do we mean by a cloud operating system. And certainly Windows 2012 brings that down to a flat line and that we are getting to a perspective now that your virtual machine or your server that is Windows 2012, it is the same server that's sitting on Azure. It's the same server that you're going to put over onto your hoster or it is the same server you're putting out. So again, it goes back to that theory of you've got to scale. All you now need to do is figure out where you're going to put the resource. So you can optimize your IT environment and your IT people to take a look at what it is they're being requested by their business and figure out that, okay, I don't have enough infrastructure on-premise or this particular solution doesn't work on-premise very well. I can very easily deploy it to the cloud. So my IT guys are cloud optimized. How does this help deal with the um, increase in, in demand for, uh, from staff for being able to use their own, their own kit? Um, because I, th I think one of the things that we've, we've seen is, is very much that um, people have higher expectations of what IT ought to be able to do at work now that they've been doing it at home on their own tablets and so forth. There's a, this one kind of probably hits off in two different directions. Um, you've got the approach for bring your own device, which is what we're seeing an awful lot of uh, people now doing. Um, and let that be a tablet or let that be a mobile phone or, or any of these smarter devices that now exist in the environment. Um, within Windows 2012 itself, we've got direct access now, which is effectively always on VPN. Um, so we're building a framework at this point that together with the system center suites and the Intune solutions, we'll be able to actually manage those devices through probably more of a governance scenario rather than actual physically managing. So we set the policy, similar to how we do today with uh, things like Exchange. So we already entrust a lot of our employees around the world to turn around and say, I have no problem with you taking uh, a device, let's say an iPhone for argument's sake, and syncing up to my email. But there's a policy that you must agree to, and I'm governing the fact that if you lose your device, I have the permission to wipe it. Um, and I think those sorts of approaches are certainly going to make our life uh, much easier. As you move into more of the slates, tablets, and laptops scenario, the requirement for users to dial back in and make a VPN connection so that we can run a log and script deploy group policy, that stuff is disappearing too. With direct access now fully wizard driven for deployment, um, in essence, the second they've got an internet connection, they are on my network. We can manage them and we can deploy them, which means in essence that those users don't have to be aware or, or even conscious of the fact that I haven't been in an office in many weeks. It's irrelevant really. So if an IT pro is tomorrow morning going to deploy Windows Server 2012, what's the first thing they should be looking for in, in terms of a benefit to themselves? PowerShell. Absolutely PowerShell. So one of the, the default things actually in a server at this point when we deploy it is that it actually is GUI-less. It doesn't have that normal user interface that we're used to. And instead, it loads up at the PowerShell command prompt. So we can see that Microsoft are already telling us through the whole theory of default installs that this is going to be your life moving forward. So certainly PowerShell where it starts. Um, so why should we look at PowerShell? Today is the automation engine behind Windows 2012, and it's going to be the future as we move forward. Um, it's completely modularized. So as we deploy more functions and features within Windows, these modules also get registered to our PowerShell environment and gives us more commandlets so we can actually customize and do much more with our server. Um, and that gives us an ability, first off, to learn easily um, the basics for using PowerShell. And then as we turn on additional modules, we get those more commands and start embracing the fact that oh, I can still do this, but now I can do some extra magic. Um, and as we start figuring out that everything that we used to use a GUI for has now got a PowerShell version. And if the truth is told, if you use most of the GUIs that's in Windows 2012, it will actually tell you what the PowerShell it was using. Certainly from the new server manager, one of the options you have is to actually see what PowerShell has been generated in the background so you can learn it and effectively start building up your own little libraries of, oh, okay, so i am got to put this particular feature on 15 machines. I'll do it on one, I'll go into the GUI, I'll grab out the PowerShell because I don't really know what I need the first time, and I can then put that into the uh, PowerShell editor. Uh, that's beautiful in that it's color-coded, it's text-sensitive, it gives us lots of context-sensitive help, and I can actually take that then and I can actually start running that on remote machines from it. Um, 
So certainly from that perspective, the modularity that we're getting here, and obviously it's not just Microsoft that are delivering it in Windows. You've got the rest of the Microsoft suites, the whole system switcher suite, and everything else that Microsoft is delivering is PowerShell enabled. And then we can go a step further and we can look at things like Intel who are delivering us our our servers and our desktops, they've got vPro technology which will turn on and off the machine a little bit like what we do for server management, except now I can do that from PowerShell and turn on and off laptops and say I want this laptop to be booted off my network or whatever the case may be or check the BIOS uh, on, on a machine. So the power of PowerShell is just absolutely amazing and the, and the more that we start embracing that um, with the modularity and all of those extra functions that are starting to show up, then this thing starts to build a life of its own. And then one of the other cool things that we have see in PowerShell, once you get past the fact that this thing has just so much potential, we start thinking about, I'm doing a process and I need to reboot the server afterwards and then I probably need to start the PowerShell running again. PowerShell now has this theory of a workflow. Um, so I can actually start off jobs and I can shelter jobs off and some things might need to be rebooted in the middle of the process. PowerShell will pick up after the reboot is complete and he'll keep going. So those workflows now actually make it much easier for us to do things like automating tasks when I would decide that, yeah, I've got a server that fills up its logs and I need to run the process of copying the logs over to a share and archiving them and zipping them. I can put that as a workflow, I can share it and I can automate the process and I can forget about it. Do you see these changes as being things that can um, free up the time of IT professionals for managing the things that they've been managing more effectively, or can they can they do something else with their time now? I think it's a little bit both. Um, the IT pro, certainly for starters, is going to spend a little bit of time learning up these new skills. Um, if they've already got skills with PowerShell, then they're, they're already there. They've got a new set of features that they're going to embrace and dig into. If PowerShell is new for them, then yeah, that's going to take a little bit longer for them to get their head around the theory of not using a GUI. But one of the benefits that we get is, is in Windows Server 2012, you can turn the GUI on and off at will. You have the PowerShell to actually say no GUI or turn GUI back on. So I can actually train myself into those scenarios and get there. When we get to that point in time where I have automated a process to say back up my archives, check my Active Directory replication, send me an email to tell me that everything is great, of course these guys have got free time coming to them. Um, and how much free time really determines on how well they go through the processes of what it is I do during a week and I kind of put a library against that or a workflow against it and then as a result what they're doing today becomes a command tomorrow giving them all the time that was associated with that particular task back to work on new things, embrace more cloud technologies, learn and manage their environments better.